Hello and welcome back to Nielsen IQ series of podcasts on e-commerce around the world. I'm Vaughan Ryan, the e-commerce leader for Asia Pacific, and I'm joined by Marcelo Osanai, who's our Latin American e-commerce expert and leader. Hi, Marcelo. How are you? Hello, Vaughan. I'm very good. Thank you very much for, for this time and for this opportunity. Um, we're going to have a bit of fun over the next 25 to 30 minutes talking about all unique aspects of e-commerce, fragmentation, other topics around e-com and how Latin America and Asia Pacific have so many synergies, but also so many differences. Let me kick it off with a bit of a, uh, a question to open it up. I know Latin America has a lot of unique attributes and you and I had a chat before yeah. the podcast, just talking about some of the local nuances. And, and you talked about this last mile delivery piece. Do you just want to share a little bit more about why this last mile delivery piece and how it's performing and why it's so unique in Latin? Sure, sure, definitely. So um, in Latin America, right, especially after pandemic, we are seeing a, a different context of e-commerce sales. And I think one of the main highlights for last year is definitely the rise up, right, of this last milers, or we can also call it quick commerce. There's many names, right, that we can refer to. But um, definitely, uh, it has been like a bigger, a very huge trend, you know, in terms of businesses connecting, you no, know, this last mile with the consumers, uh, especially, you know, for, for beverages. I think this one is one of the main highlights, how companies are reinventing themselves to better serve consumers. And uh, not only that, right, we can also see consumers are getting more used to this type of services and uh, start valuing, right, this convenience of receiving, you no know, cold, fresh products in a very quick way and uh, without having to leave their household. So it's something that's been very, you know, strong here. Many players rising every month, you know, trying to get a piece of this market. And it has been like a huge change, right, for all the FMCG uh, manufacturers and retailers. And, and Marcelo, I know in Asia Pacific, we were delivery as quick commerce. And you and I were talking about all the different phrases that are being used. And you can call it last mile. I know some other people are calling it QCOM, fast delivery, hourly delivery. When we, my experience in Asia Pacific is it's interesting which categories are starting to take off in this quick com last mile delivery. And one of the, the fascinating factors for me is alcohol. And I've used this as an example in the past, but over 50% of alcohol sales in the off-premise are being sold online in Singapore now. Mm. Have you got any unique categories you're seeing in Latin America that you know you call out for this last mile delivery? You mentioned fresh, but anything else? Yeah, and um, especially, let, let me talk about alcohol first, right? So when we talk about total yeah. e-commerce, platforms, websites, and apps, Definitely uh, liquor like whiskey, vodka, gin, and rum are the highlights, right? Like it's amazing the relevance of e-commerce as a total right platform for whiskey, for example, because of the high value, because of it's a very specific type of product, no, and also of the specific needs of the shopper. It's one of the biggest highlights, right, for e-commerce in the last years. Like it's amazing is it's already maybe the third or second biggest channel for for brazil for this specific category and it's very interesting right for how this high level for high level products and um such as whiskey or wine the e-commerce has been instrumental right for the development of uh of the consumption and this fragmentation right of different types of channels emerging into into the latin american uh consumer then I think there's a not, another step, right, that how the e-commerce evolved and then we go into the last miler um, business. And I think one of the biggest value that I, I think consumers are seeing and noticing is the ability, right, to get access to alcohol products such as beer. I think this is one of the biggest highlights. And not only beer because of the sortment, because of the price or because of the convenience, but because also they can get cold beer in a very quick and convenient way, right? Uh, so business managed to develop a whole infrastructure uh, that can serve consumers like in 30 minutes with com a competitive pricing and plus the convenience of getting, receiving their products, right? Whatever the, the shopper needs in a quick way and most important in a cold way, right? Which is a very also big win. 
And it has been like a very successful business case uh, here in Brazil. Local apps, um, some uh, manufacturer apps also developing and getting to this business. And I think this is the main highlight, how we started, right? This last mile for FMCG products. Now we are seeing also evolving into other type of categories, such as fresh products uh, and even other more mainstream categories like household cleaning or anything, right, that consumer might need in a very quick and convenient way. Now they have this, there is this platform or this infrastructure available to serve the consumers. I know in, again, and I refer to my region, that the, the challenge for many manufacturers and retailers out there is to go on with a one size fits all. So I can talk about Singapore and talk about, you know, 50 plus percent of alcohol being sold online. But the reality is Singapore is unique across Asia Pacific. Yes. You know, at the other end of the spectrum, you get markets that still it's a, a huge off-premise component. One of the interesting factors I was talking in Indonesia recently was about the fact that despite the actual market share of e-commerce being relatively small compared to a Korea or a China, it's interesting that Indonesia is fast becoming the third biggest e-commerce market in absolute value in the world. Now, you're being based in another a large population country like Brazil. You know, you've got Mexico as well up uh, north. Tell us a little bit about the unique attributes of some of the markets in Latin America and that despite e-commerce being relatively small in terms of market share, not a China or a Korea or a US market share, what about some of the values and some of the growth numbers you've seen? Yeah, that's a very good question, Bob. Um, we all know, right, that... Um... In the last three years, we had a, a very big right <laughs> uh, driver for e-commerce development, yep. which is the COVID-19. So basically every market, every manufacturer and every retailer had to reinvent themselves and start getting into this, into this channel. Uh, and I think the last years we've seen a high levels growth in both like all the Latin American markets in terms of e-commerce development double digit high double digit growth right talking specifically about brazil we've seen 40 percent in in 2021 and 30 percent 2022 but now as overall e-commerce we are seeing already a decline right not necessarily like a decrease of, of sales but a slowdown of growth uh but when we go deeper in terms of understanding what are the categories driving these results definitely we see electronics and mobile and furniture going no down because of uh, again the recovery of offline stores but we are seeing niche not niche categories but niche categories for the e-commerce or not traditional categories for e-commerce at least in brazil like like fmcg categories rising up taking you know a, a bit of this market share and exploring the opportunity uh, that this channel they can bring bring right to the reality of the consumer. So I think it's interesting to see how now FMCG is taking a, a more relevant role in Latin America, uh, bringing you know, the frequency or the, the, um, the more volume, right? At least the more volume aspect for these yeah. platforms and making sure that the consumers are constantly visiting these websites. And I think this is one of the interesting things I've seen in the last year. Uh, and I think one specific difference that I see, especially be between Mexico and Brazil, is the relevance of local players, right? Brazil, I see we have a stronger presence of our Brazilian you know, marketplaces that are already established here, uh, that started as a brick and click, a brick and mortar. Now it, it became uh, going to the brick and click, right, type of operation and expanding their footprint into the marketplace. While Mexico is still more concentrated uh, with Amazon, with Mercado Livre, uh, and also like Walmart with strong presence. So it's more concentrated you know, in these players while Brazil have a, a more fragmented market share between some international players like Mercado Livre and Amazon, but also some very national uh, retailers with strong presence and strong connect connection with the consumers. We have a lot of marketplace or applications in this part of the world, and those marketplaces have both direct and indirect sales. So to give you a little bit of statistics from our e-commerce accelerator that we have in Asia Pacific, uh, in beauty, for example, in Thailand, there's about 35,000 resellers that use just one application, right? 
So you think about the challenge of 35,000 stores on one app, potentially selling 10, 15 items each app. You know, there's going to be a lot of crossover. And with that comes in play a lot of price components to it. I know that one of the major reasons reasons from a recent consumer study we did why shoppers shop online is because of price. And tell us a little bit about the these sort of open platforms that you've got in. Maybe Brazil seems the sort of market that does have these. And the amount of resellers, both direct and indirect, that are on there and what's their primary focus? Is it price? Is it range? Is it unique local offerings? Yeah, I think it's in this sense, I think e-commerce is very similar, right? All over the world. I think pricing is definitely one of the main uh, drivers for, right? For the consumers. Therefore, it's definitely one of the main strategy for the sellers, for the platforms to bring in value to the consumers. Um, I think, as I mentioned, right? Brazil, I think it's a more fragmented and more, there are more players, more competitive marketplace scenario, which for the consumers will be good, right? Which, which there is more uh, competition regarding better services, better delivery time, better delivery costs. And I think this has been a good thing, right? That we have a, a, a higher competitive scenario among the marketplaces. Um, while I think uh, another, I think, Specific specific thing about Brazilian markets that I've seen specific players, right? Especially local players trying to diversify their markets and um, doing a lot of acquisitions of different type of businesses to try to consolidate a, a bigger footprint, right? Like uh, usually maybe a previous brick and mortar focus on furniture now they are expanding to electronics but not only like offering electronics but also buying specific brands right who has some expertise and some equity into the electronics market on the beauty market and so on so we are seeing you now like a trend of these specific local and international marketplace expanding their footprint on different uh, categories by acquisition or you know in some ways trying to develop some expertise to diversify this strategy, right? Otherwise, again, they cannot be limited to electronics and furniture, as was traditionally e-commerce in Brazil. They definitely need to bring some expertise in different uh, categories in order to be more relevant and right and engage better with the consumers. We talked a little bit at the beginning around fragmentation, and we talk a lot about fragmentation in e-commerce. And uh, we'll, we'll talk about profitability in a moment. But it seems very hard to pick which retailers to invest in. And I'm not suggesting that you come out and say you need to invest in A, B, or C. But I know in Asia, you know, the, the profitability story has meant there's been a lot of come and go retailers in this space. And even the bricks and mortar guys that are entering the space are really struggling with the lack of profitability. In fact, in some cases, it's a significant loss. I'm guessing you're facing the same thing. And 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 have many retailers come and gone? And is it a, just a moving feast at the moment? Uh, yeah, that's a very good question, Bob. Um, profitability, it's an issue, right? Not only, uh, I guess, in APEC, but definitely in Latin America. And I can see basically two, right, two, two explanations for this, or maybe even more. There's more reasons behind it. But I've seen, first of all, right, Retailers or businesses were not ready for COVID, right? And that yeah. forced everyone to do short-term investments or try to catch up, right? And build some type of knowledge or infrastructure in order to be into this place. I think this one, one of the reality, we were not prepared for COVID. We we're not prepared for even this moment that we're living right now. I think this yeah. is one of the reality. Uh, the other reality also is that Everyone wants a piece of this e-commerce, right? Of this market, everyone, and it's a fact, right? We know that e-commerce is the future, so there is a a, a high de, like high demand or or it, it there is a high right in terms of businesses want to have a piece of this, but a lot of times they do not have yet right the expertise into operating a high complex operation such as e-commerce because it's definitely. It requires a level of expertise, requires a lot of investment technology, and also requires um, 
for the specific shoppers, right? Willing to to spend and willing to visit and 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 buy on your, your website or your app. So I think this creates a complexity in terms of the environment that yet it's a challenge for most of the, the players here to bring high level of profitability. But I think it's important for them to understand that this is not, again, a short-term investment, right? This is a long-term investment. They need to start to build not only internal capabilities, internal expertise, but also educate right, the consumers in terms of the benefits of buying on e-commerce or buying online in order to build right this environment for the long term. So it has to be a long-term investment and not only seeing on the short-term um, results, right? But again, it, it's a, a, a task not only for the retailers, but especially for the brands, right? Also brands, yeah. they need to understand the relevance of this environment and invest for the future. Yeah, and it's an interesting one. People all look at the Amazon example, and we must remember that I don't know exactly how many years, but Amazon's about a 20-year-old company. It started out as a bookstore, and then it moved into other categories. And yes, it's profitable today, but it's not profitable in every market either. And it's a long-haul game, like most retailers play the game. So I expect that to be another challenge for many of them. I'm interested just to take a little shift for a moment, and we talk a lot about, again, about this fragmentation, but specifically... When you start to see brands, are we? Is certainly in this part of the world, we're seeing brands that are only launched into the online space, right? They're really driving the message home online. It's obviously cheaper from a distribution sense at the beginning anyway, if you're not worried about the logistics management. And their share of voice can be a lot larger and they create a bit of a cult following. And some of these are really playing against some of the largest companies in the region. We're talking... You know, the big five to 10 companies that play in the multinationals globally are actually losing share. It's a really strong local cult figure, if you like, brands. Are you seeing similar trends in Latin? We are seeing specific cases, right, of, of emerging native online brands uh, coming up and, and getting a piece of this market share. Definitely, but we're not, right? We are far away from, from APEC, from Asia overall, in terms of the relevance for the channel and how uh, influence and the, the impact of this that the, these brands can have. Uh, I think definitely we are maybe still five years behind you know, over the, this Asia trend or Asia level of the relevance yeah. of e-commerce. However, something that I've, I, I always talk to my clients, right, is... E-commerce is not a mirror of offline. And I think, although this is a very basic concept, right, that it's a different channel, different consumers and different uh, competitive scenario, I think this is still you know, something that we need to absorb, understand this and make sure that we are making decisions and making uh, our strategy based on this very simple concept that online is different than offline, right? That we have different reality of competitive scenario of brands. We have different shoppers or different uh, specific needs that implicates on a different assortment of products, different strategies of price and so on. So, and uh, in this sense, right, definitely native brands start to making a, a, a dent, right? And start to impact the market share of, uh, of this global brand. They are starting to notice this, even though, again, it's not a bigger threat or a real threat in the present, they need to be aware of this because if they do not be, they're not aware right now, right? It will become a loss in the near future. Yeah, hundred percent. And this is the real challenge, right? We talk a lot at NIQ about Omni and Omni is a really, it's an easy word to say. It's a difficult th thing to navigate <laughs> and the ability to manage offline. I remember in my old sales days, a boss used to say it's distribution, shelving and display. And in a way, online is the same, but what does distribution mean is very different. What does shelving look like in a digital commerce world is very different. And display is all about screaming. So I think an interesting discussion recently I've had with a number of manufacturers is who pays for what? The old adage against sales versus marketing. Is it a marketing spend when you advertise online or is it a sales spend when you advertise online in a digital store? Because essentially the digital store is about the execution element of this, but ad spend is typically being related back to digital spend and digital spend in a store. It's a really fascinating aspect to this and who owns what and who doesn't own what. And I don't think 
in a 30 minute podcast, we're going to be able to answer that. But are you seeing similar debates? in Brazil, Mexico, other markets within Latin America? Definitely, definitely. This is a, a huge challenge, especially, right, on a scenario where on the short term, offline is recovering relevance yeah. and online is a future bet, right, future investment. There's a lot of discussion on this, like who should pay for this? How should we invest on this? Like uh, this is not bringing right short term results. Why are we focusing on this? So I think uh, this is a reality of the, uh, you know, for, for most of global and local companies. Uh, but in a simple way, definitely, you no, know, they, they need to figure out you know, that they, they need actually to understand that e-commerce is definitely the future. Not only, it's not a bet, right? It's a reality that e-commerce will become one of the major channels for consumption for FMCG categories and brands. And therefore, again, they need to start adjusting, right? Their ways of working, how they operate and how they make plans in order to have this in mind. Otherwise, uh, it's a huge threat if they're not looking into this, uh, into this space and it will become, right, uh, a bigger risk if they do not invest and get ready uh, right now. So when we talk a little bit, Marcelo, about the fragmentation, and I keep coming back to this word fragmentation because it's extremely challenging for a manufacturer or retailer as they enter the uh, the digital commerce world, what to do. Uh, in recent podcasts, we've talked about um, this social commerce element and how the influencers, or as I like to say to my daughters, the influencers at times, but like how they play their role in China and increasingly throughout Asia, we're seeing groups like TikTok, we've seen Instagram, these groups that are really starting to play a fairly significant role in terms of selling. And even more interesting is in some fairly staple categories in FMCG. Are you seeing similar trends in your part of the world? Similar, definitely. Um, social media overall, you know, it, it, it has become, it has become you know, like a, a reality for most of the Brazilian consumers. Definitely, we are, again, in a different levels in terms of digitalization, right? Uh, because we are a developing country. There's still a lot of, uh, we, even on the basic things, right, in terms of access to internet, it's still, we still, most of the population struggles for this. However, for the urban, right, shoppers, I think it's a reality for people to have access to a smartphone, access to internet. Uh, and then social media becomes one of, definitely one of the main channels of, engaging with these consumers and uh, because right, of, of this value of customizing and personalization, how the, this information uh, gets to the consumers, I think a lot of the companies are shifting or already shifted, right? Most of their budgets, marketing budgets to this type of uh, right, investment. And we are seeing a lot how they, these consumers or how these uh, influencers are connecting, right? With the platforms, with the retailers, to better uh, drive specific strategies for the brands. I think this is a, a reality for Brazil. It, it is definitely limited still, right? For urban shoppers, for younger, middle-aged uh, consumers, but it's definitely on a trend, right? Of uh, consolidating as one of the main channels of influencing the, the consumers and connecting to the shoppers. So I guess we're starting to wind up the podcast a bit, Marcelo, and I, I... I challenge you a little bit around, so give me some crazy statistics that scare the hell out of some of our clients from a Latin American perspective. Are there any numbers that you can throw at me that give me the wow factor from an e-com and where it's at in LATAM at the moment? Yeah, for sure. So, for example, one of the main numbers, right, that we had closing the 2022 uh, results, which is, again, is very interesting to see this, right? Total e-commerce as a, as a channel, right, that includes all the categories, and all the consumption overall grew only 1.6%, which is, again, below the inflation. And this could be, like a, again, a not very uh, optimistic number. But again, when we go into the category level and we see food growth, right? We see um, the number of orders in terms of food categories grew 80%. Wow. Again, it's amazing, right, to see that overall e-commerce, when we could include electronics and furniture, whatever, it's going down. But when we go deeper into it and we see food categories, uh, beauty categories, beverages, and etc., 
they are uh, still growing in a very high pace because again, it's a huge opportunity for the retailers and for the brands to get into the space, take advantage of the infrastructure of the environment and of the shoppers that are already there, right? Connected to the internet and uh, start diversifying the ways that they serve these consumers. So it's it's very interesting that we st- there's a lot of opportunity for FMC categories to explore this channel. And it's a huge opportunity, right, for brands and retailers. Marcelo, I'm impressed. For those watching on the screen, you might see that Marcelo is based in Brazil and I'm based in Singapore. So it's a really early morning for him. So he looks fresh and I'm at the end of my day. So uh, <laughs> special thanks to Marcelo for getting up nice and early to cater for this weird time between Asia and uh, the the Americas. Uh, Thanks for joining the podcast. And for those that are listening closely, got questions, comments, any other topics you'd like us to talk about, make sure you uh, get back to Marcelo and I, and we'd be happy to uh, respond. Thanks, Marcelo, for your time. Thank you, Vaughn. Have a good night. You too.